Hello, and welcome back to Lily's Viking Adventure. Thank you for joining me. I first would like to apologize because I haven't made a video for this channel in quite a while, and that is because I've had some exciting things in development. So I've created an Etsy store where I'm making cool Viking and Gothic, because I'm Gothic, I'm a Gothic girl at heart back when they used to call it mod. Um, I was the first person in my high school to dye my hair all black. So I'm making gothic, witchy kind of mugs and Viking inspired mugs. Um, and I'm having a lot of fun with that, but it's taken up a lot of my time, so I haven't had time to record for this channel. Uh, today I decided to do a little video on Huldras uh, and also Nerthus. So those are the two I'm going to talk about today. And then later this week I will try to get another installment of uh, Princess of Mars out because I know that's, pro you know, probably people are waiting for that. So I will do another installment of that this week and also Maybe by the weekend, I'll do another installment of the Oralenda, which I am almost completely through with. So I think probably two or three more of those, and I'll be done with the Oralenda. So if you're waiting for those, they're coming, I promise. And uh, I'm going to get started now with the Holdra and Nerthus. Oh, and also, I will put links to the new Etsy and Printify shop in the descriptions of this video if you want to go check those out. I think I made some kind of cool cups, so check them out, please, if you will. All right, let's go. Holdra, Norse forest lady, beautiful and tricky creatures that all men should handle with care or risk severe punishment. Isn't it always the way? What lures you is usually the most dangerous. The Holdra has appeared in several stories by well-known authors, but there is something so dark and tempting about this creature that I'm surprised there haven't been more stories about the Holdra beautiful and tricky creatures. Holdra is a seductive forest spirit from Norse mythology that has been known to offer rewards to those who satisfy them sexually and death to those who fail to do so, kind of like some women also. It is said the Holdra are a type of troll but much smaller, their abilities and power. These long-haired blonde beauties lure men into the woods by their lovely singing and appearance to do their bidding or simply as mates or pets. If betrayed, the Huldra are known to punish their victims severely. Ouch, you don't want to upset this gal. She is prone to stealing human babies and replaces them with her own children, a Huldrabarn. If she decides to marry a human man, the Huldra can no longer keep her identity secret because during the marriage ceremony, when a priest blesses her, the glamour leaves her, revealing who she really is. Some sources say she loses her tail if she enters a church or is blessed, but her nature remains, and if the man mistreats her, she will turn incredibly ugly, and the man will suffer, much like some women. I'd suggest guys simply stick away from this girl. It does not turn out pretty for you. Her physical appearance. From the front, the Huldra is a beautiful young woman, but also has a cow's tail and whose back appears to be like a hollowed out tree. Most men 
would likely run away once they caught sight of the tail. In Sweden, the Huldra is said to have the tail of a fox, which has to be better than a cow's tail. Does it? I like cow's tail. I'm a Taurus, so I guess cow's tail is sexy too. Huldra <laughs> is a seductive forest spirit. Let's see. Oh, I lost my place here. Oh yeah, okay, there we go. Um, and in addition to the cow's tail, frequently is shown with tree limbs or vines or leaves also coming from her back. And usually in a forest setting. Basically, if you meet a Holdra, you're supposed to just leave her alone because that's the best way, is just to not interact. And so on to Nerthus. Nerthus. In Germanic paganism, Nerthus is the goddess associated with a ceremonial wagon procession. Nerthus is attested for, by first century AD Roman historian Tacitus in his ethnographic work, Germania, as a Mother Earth. In Germania, Tacitus records that a group of Germanic peoples were particularly distinguished by their veneration of the goddess. Tacitus describes the wagon procession in some detail. Nerthus's cart is found on an unspecified island in the ocean, where it is kept in a sacred grove and draped in white cloth. Only a priest may touch it. When the priest detects Nerthus's presence by the cart, the cart is also drawn by heifers. Nerthus's cart is met with celebration and peacetime everywhere it goes. And during her procession, no one goes to war and all iron objects are locked away. In time, after the goddess has had her fill of human company, the priest returns the cart to her temple and slaves richly wash the goddess, her cart, and the cloth in a secluded lake. According to Tacitus, the slaves are then immediately drowned in the lake. Harsh. Scholars have linked Tacitus' description of ceremonial wagons found from around Tacitus' time up until the Viking Age, particularly the Germanic Iron Age, Dejajjörg, Dejberge wagon in Denmark, and the Viking Age Alsaberg ship, burial wagon in Norway. The goddess's name, Nerthus, from Proto-Germanic, Nerthus, is the early Germanic etymological precursor to the Old Norse deity named Njordr, a male deity who is comparably associated with wagons and water in Norse mythology. Together with his children, Freya and Freyr, the three form the Vanir, a family of deities. The Old Norse record, record contains three narratives featuring ritual wagon processions that scholars have compared to Tacitus' description of Nerthus's wagon. Too many S's all in a row. One of them, which, and potentially all of them, focus on Njordr's son Freyr. Additionally, scholars have sought to explain the difference in gender between the early Germanic and Old Norse forms of the deity discussed potential etymological connections to the obscure female deity named Njurun. Mention of the mysterious sister wife of Njurdr. Proposed a variety of locations for where the procession may have occurred, generally in Denmark, and considered Tacitus's sources for his description. 
Tacitus as a Nerthus has had some influence on popular culture, and in particularly the now widely rejected manuscript reading of Hirtha in Germany. Germania, in chapter 40 of his ethnography, Germania, Roman historian Tacitus discussing the Subian tribes of Germania writes that besides the populace, Simones, and warlike Longobardi, there are seven more remote Subian tribes, the Rudingi, the Aviones, Angli, Barini, Eudosis, Surines, and Nuitones. The seven tribes are surrounded by rivers and forests, and according to Tacitus, there is nothing particularly worthy of comment about them as individuals. Yet, they are particularly distinguished as a group in that they all worship the goddess Nerthus. By contrast, the Langobardi are distinguished by being few in number, Surrounded by many mighty peoples, they have protected themselves not by submissiveness, but by battle and boldness. Next to them come the Rudingi, Avionis, Angli, Varini, Eudosis, Surines, and Huitones, protected by river and forests. There is nothing especially noteworthy about these states individually, but they are distinguished by a common worship of Nerthus, that is, Mother Earth, and believes that she intervenes in human affairs and rides through their peoples. There is a sacred grove on an island in the ocean in which there is a consecrated chariot draped with cloth where the priest alone may touch he perceives the pre presence of the goddess in the innermost shrine and with great reverence escorts her in her chariot, which is drawn by female cattle. There are days of rejoicing, then the countryside celebrates the festival, wherever she designs to visit and to accept hospitality. No one goes to war, no one takes up arms, all objects of iron are locked away. Then, and only then, do they experience peace and quiet. Only then do they prize them until the goddess has had her fill of human society and the priest brings her back to the temple. Afterwards, the chariot, the cloth, and if one may believe it, the deity herself are washed in a hidden lake. The slaves who perform this office are immediately swallowed up in the same lake. Hence arises dread of the mysterious and piety, which keeps them ignorant of what only those about to perish may see. <clears throat> Harold Mattingly Translation the Langobardi, by contrast, are distinguished by the fewness of their numbers. Ringed round as they are by many mighty peoples, they find safety not in obsequiousness, but in battle and its perils. After them come the Rudingi, Aviones, Angli, Varini, Eustosis, Sorini, and Nuitones. Behind their ramparts of rivers and woods, there's nothing noteworthy about these people individually, but they are distinguished by a common worship of Nerthus, Mother Earth. They believe that she interests herself in human affairs and rides among their peoples. In an island <clears throat> of the ocean stands a sacred grove, and in the grove a consecrated cart draped with cloth, which none but the priest may touch. The priest perceives the presence of the goddess in this holy of holies and attends her in deepest reverence as her cart is drawn by heifers. Then follow days of rejoicing and merrymaking in every place that she designs to visit and be entertained. 
No one goes to war. No one takes up arms. Every object of iron is locked away. Then, and only then, are peace and quiet known and loved until the priest again restores the goddess to her temple when she has had her fill of human company. After that, the cart, the cloth, and if you care to believe it, the goddess herself are washed clean in a secluded lake. This service is performed by slaves who are immediately afterwards drowned in the lake. Thus mystery begets terror, terror and pious reluctance to ask what the sight can be that only those doomed to die may see. Tacitus's sources. I liked that second uh, interpretation better, actually. Tacitus does not provide information regarding his sources for his description of Nerthus, nor the rest of Germania. Tacitus' account may stem from earlier but now lost literary works, such as perhaps Pliny the Elder's lost Bella Germanae, potentially his own experiences in Germania, or merchants and soldiers, such as Germanic peoples in Rome, or Germania and Romans who spent time in the region. Tacitus's Germania places particular emphasis on the Simones, and scholars have suggested that some or all of Tacitus's information may come from King Masias of the Simones and or his high priestess, the seeress Ghana. The two visited Rome for a blessing from Roman Emperor Domitian in 92 AD. While Tacitus appears to have been away from Rome during this period, he would have had plenty of opportunity to gain information provided by King Masius and Ghana from those who spent time with the two during their visit. Name and Manuscript Variations All surviving manuscripts of Tacitus's Germania date from around the 15th century, and these display significant variation in the name of the goddess. All attested forms, are in accusative case and include Nurtum, yielding the nominate form Nurthus, Hurtum, implying a nominative form of Hertha, and several others, including Noctum, Nietum, Nechirthum, and Vertum. And, and this is the way with all gods and goddesses. They all have many names. So there's never just one name. I mean, many cultures can venerate them across great distances and different languages. And so they, they translate, they might be worshiping the same deity, but in another language, it's pronounced differently, it's spelled differently. So there are many names for all of the gods and all of the goddesses. Of the various forms found in the extant Germania manuscript tradition, two have yielded significant discussion among scholars since at least the 19th century, Nerthus and Hertha. Hertha was popular in some of the earliest layers of Germania scholarship, such as the addition of Beatus Rianinus. These scholars linked the name with a common German word for earth, Compare modern, modern German Irta. This reading has subsequently been rejected by most scholars, since pioneering 19th century philologist Jacob Grimm's identification of the form Nerthus as the etymological precursor to the Old Norse deity name Njörður. The reading Nerthus has been widely accepted as correct in scholarship. In 1902, the Codex Asinus, often abbreviated as E, was discovered and it was also found to contain the form Nertum, yielding the reading Nerthus. The Codex Asinus is a 15th century composite manuscript that is considered a direct copy of the Codex Hersfeldenesis, 
the oldest identifiable manuscript of the text. All other manuscripts of Tacitus's Germania are thought by scholars to stem from the Codex Asinus. Some scholars have continued suggesting alternate readings to Nerthus. For example, in 1992, Lot Motz proposes that the linguistic correspondence is a coincidence and that the variant Nerthum was chosen by Grimm because it corresponds to Neurther. Instead, Motz proposed that various female entities from the continental Germanic folklore record, particularly those in central Germany and the Alps, stem from a single source, whom she identifies as Nerthus, and that migrating Germanic peoples brought the goddess to those regions from coastal Scandinavia. After her death, Motz's proposal received support from Rudolf Simic. John Lindau rejects Motz's proposal and Simic's support. He highlights the presence of the form in the Codex Asinus, discovered in 1902, while Grimm died in, in 1863, and asks, would it not be an extraordinary coincidence that a deity who fits the pattern of the latter fertility gods should have a name that is etymologically identical with one of them? Anders Anderin says, In the accounts of specific Germanic tribes, Tacitus also writes about the divine twins, the Alisis, among the Narhavali, and about the goddess Nerthus, among a group of tribes, probably located in the southern part of present-day Denmark. Some scholars have proposed that the location of the Nerthus procession occurred on Zeeland in Denmark. They link the Nerthus with the medieval place named Niartharum, modern Nierum, located on Zeeland. Further justification is given in that the Hier, the seat of the ancient kings of Denmark, is also located on Zeeland. Nerthus is then commonly compared to the goddess Gefon, who is said to have plowed the island of Zealand from Sweden in the prose Edda book Gilfagenning, and then Liher wed the legendary Danish king Skjöldr. Chambers notes that the mistaken name Hirtha, see name and manuscript variations above, led to the Hydronym Hirthasee, a lake on the German island of Rügen, which antiquarians proposed as a potential location of the Nerthus site described in Tacitus. However, along with the rejection of the reading Hirtha, the location is no longer considered to be a potential site. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> gender difference between Nerthus and Njordr. Although Njordr etymologically descends from Nerthus, Tacitus describes Nerthus female, while the old, deity, old Norse deity Njordr is male. The form Nerthus does not indicate whether the deity was considered male or female. This difference in gender between the two has resulted in significant discussion from scholars a variety of reasons for this difference have been proposed. Over the years, scholars have variously proposed that Nerthus was likely one of a pair of deities in a manner, manner similar to Njordr's incestuous children, Freyr and Freya, perhaps involving Hairos, Gamos. That Nerthus was a hermaphroditic deity that the deity's gender simply changed from female to male over time, or that Tacitus's account mistakes Nerthus for a female deity rather than a male deity. Others have proposed that a female Njordr continues into the Old Norse corpus as the sister wife of Njordr and or in the goddess name Njorun. Wagons, wagon processions, the veneer, and cyclical rituals 
Scholars associate Tacitus' description of Nerthus's vehiculum ritually deposited in Alacus with ceremonial wagons found ritually placed in peat de bogs around Tacitus's time. Ceremonial wagons from the Viking Age and descriptions of ceremonial wagon processions in Old Norse texts. Notable examples include Dierberg wagon, in fact a composite of two wagons discovered in western Jutland, Denmark. A wagon from the Viking Age was found in the Osseberg ship burial in Norway. This wagon may have been incapable of turning corners and may have been used solely for ritual purposes. The ship burial contains tapestry fragments, today known as the Osseberg tapestry fragments. These fragments depict a wagon procession. The reconstructed ceremonial wagon found in the Viking Age Osseberg ship burial. One side of the wagon features a depiction of nine cats. The reconstructed ceremonial wagon found in the Viking Age Osseberg ship burial. In Norse mythology, Njordr is strongly associated with water, and he and his children, Freyr and Freya, are particularly associated with wagons. Together, this family is known in Old Norse resources, Nor Norse sources, as the Vanir. Njordr is referred to as the god of wagons, Old Norse Vangagut. In the principal manuscript of Skaldsparmal, the Codex Regis, according to the Prosetta, Freya drives a chariot driven by cats which scholars have linked to the depiction of the nine cats on the Osberg ship burial wagon, potentially indicating a wagon procession featuring the goddess. Dated to the 14th century, Ogumandar Patar Dietz tells of a ritual wagon procession wherein a depiction of Freyr is driven around in a wagon by a priestess in a manner scholars have compared to Tacitus's description. Similar wagon procession narratives may be found in two other texts, namely, description of a deity named Lithir in Flatjarbak, and one featuring Frotho in Gesta Denorum, who was driven around for three days after his death so that the country wouldn't crumble both of these names have been interpreted by scholars as likely by names for Freyr. Again, with the many names. Some scholars have interpreted this to reflect that this procession occurred as a cyclical ritual associated with the veneer, according to Jens Peter Sjöld. If we accept a close relationship among, perhaps even an identity of, Nerthus, Freyr, and Frotho. It appears that these three descriptions are all part of a discourse connecting gods of the veneer type with circumnabulations and thus with processions focusing on yearly rituals. Schrott further writes, cyclical rituals have no doubt taken place during several millennia in the north as well as everywhere else. One of the most famous descriptions of such a ritual from the early Iron Age is Tacitus's description of the Nerthus ritual in Germania, chapter 40. Although it is not said explicitly that this is a cyclical ritual, there is no doubt that it is recurring and that it involves the whole community. Like with most other rituals of this type, we are not told at what time of year the Nerthus procession took place. And as a side note, that's probably because it's assumed knowledge. So during, and we, we do this to this day, writers will write things with assumed knowledge for the time. So people would just know, you wouldn't have to say that out loud because you're not, you're writing for current people, not necessarily future people, though we should write for future people, especially if we are a historian. 
But that is something that's done frequently. We may conjecture that it was not during the summer, which was the season for war and other kinds of male activities. Hilda Davidson draws a parallel between these incidents and Tacitus's account of Nerthus, suggesting that in addition, a neck ring wearing female figure kneeling as if to drive a chariot also dates from the Bronze Age. Davidson says that evidence suggests that similar customs as detailed in Tacitus's account continued to exist during the close of the pagan period through worship of the veneer. Bog bodies. The face of the Toland man, a well-preserved, richly deposited bog body found in Denmark and dated to the 4th century BC. Known as bog bodies, numerous well-preserved human remains have been found in peat bogs in Northern Europe. Like the wagons interred in peat bogs discussed above, these bodies were intentionally and richly placed. Various scholars have linked Tacitus' description of drowned slaves in a lake as a reference to the internment of human corpses in peat bogs. For example, according to archaeologist Peter Wilhelm Globe, the description of the goddess attendance in the lake on the completion of the rites recalls the sacrificed bog people. There is indeed much to suggest the bog people were participant, participants in ritual celebrations of this kind, which culminated in their death and deposition in the bogs. Mother Earth and the Roman cult of Sibylle. In his description of Nerthus, Tacitus refers to the goddess as Mother Earth, Terra Mater. This has been received by scholars in a variety of ways and affected early manuscript readings of the deity's name, especially Hertham. In his assessment of the Old Norse personification of Earth, Njord, a goddess in Norse mythology, McKinnell says that the Old Norse Earth personification does not appear to be notably connected to the veneer Njordr, and or Nerthus. He concludes that it seems likely that Tacitus equates Nerthus with Teramater as an interpretatio romana, a translation into terms his Roman readers would find familiar. John Lindau says that Tacitus's identification with Mother Earth probably has much less to do with Jord in Scandinavian mythology than with fertility goddesses in many cultures. The Phrygian goddess Sibylle had been absorbed into the Roman pantheon by Tacitus's time, and Tacitus served as a priest in the cult of Sibylle, which included deities such as duties, such as washing a sacred cult stone, similar to Tacitus's description of Nerthus. Sibylle was at times closely connected to or conflated with the concept of Terra Mater, Mother Earth. Through her identity as Mother Diem, Mother of the Gods, and at times depicted with a chariot pulled by lions. So that's it for my bit on Nerthus and the Holdra. Two of definitely some of my favorites. They both have my heart and call to me. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope that you learned something. And if you did, if you got this far, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it if you would just click the like for just a quick second and help me to grow this channel, get it into the algorithms so that people see it, um, people that would be interested in it, see it more frequently. Um, we all live by algorithms these days. I hate it. It's very, very annoying. Um, but I'm gonna lit. I'm going to put my new Etsy channel uh, or my new Etsy website in the description below, and a few other things. And I hope that you will take a look at those. Please like, share, subscribe if you haven't. All of that really helps me out. And thank you so much. I love you guys from the bottom of my heart. 
and I will see you next time, okay?